Chapter Eleven of Dombey and Son. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Mill Nicholson. Dombey and Son by Charles Dickens. Chapter Eleven Paul's Introduction to a New Scene. Mrs. Pipchin's constitution was made of such hard metal, in spite of its liability to the fleshly weaknesses of standing in need of repose after chops, and of requiring to be coaxed to sleep by the soporific agency of sweetbreads, that it utterly set at naught the predictions of Mrs. Wickham, and showed no symptoms of decline. Yet, as Paul's rapt interest in the old lady continued unbated, Mrs. Wickham would not budge an inch from the position she had taken up, Fortifying and entrenching herself on the strong ground of her uncle's Betsy Jane, she advised Miss Berry, as a friend, to prepare herself for the worst, and forewarned her that her aunt might at any time be expected to go off suddenly like a powder mill. "'I hope, Miss Berry,' Mrs. Wickham would observe, "'that you'll come into whatever little property there may be to leave. You deserve it, I am sure.' "'for yours is a trying life, "'though there don't seem much worth coming into. "'You'll excuse my being so open "'in this dismal den.' "'Poor Berry took it all in good part, "'and drudged and slaved away as usual, "'perfectly convinced that Mrs. Pipchin "'was one of the most meritorious persons in the world, "'and making every day innumerable sacrifices of herself "'upon the altar of that noble old woman.' but all these immolations of berry were somehow carried to the credit of mrs pipchin by mrs pipchin's friends and admirers and were made to harmonize with and carry out that melancholy fact of the deceased mr pipchin having broken his heart in the peruvian mines for example there was an honest grocer and general dealer in the retail line of business between whom and mrs pipchin there was a small memorandum book with a greasy red cover perpetually in question, and concerning which diverse secret councils and conferences were continually being held between the parties to that register, on the mat in the passage, and with closed doors in the parlour. Nor were there wanting dark hints from Master Bitherstone, whose temper had been made revengeful by the solar heats of India acting on his blood, of balances unsettled, and of a failure, on one occasion within his memory, in the supply of moist sugar at tea-time. This grocer, being a bachelor, and not a man who looked upon the surface for beauty, had once made honourable offers for the hand of Berry, which Mrs. Pipchin had, with contumely and scorn, rejected. Everybody said how laudable this was in Mrs. Pipchin, relict of a man who had died at the Peruvian mines, and what a staunch, high, independent spirit the old lady had. But nobody said anything about poor Berry, who cried for six weeks being soundly rated by her good aunt all the time, and lapsed into a state of hopeless spinsterhood. "'Berry is very fond of you, ain't she?' Paul once asked Mrs. Pipchin, when they were sitting by the fire with the cat. "'Yes,' said Mrs. Pipchin. "'Why?' asked Paul. "'Why?' returned the disconcerted old lady. "'How can you ask such a thing, sir? "'Why are you fond of your sister Florence?' "'Because she's very good,' said Paul. "'There's nobody like Florence.' "'Well,' retorted Mrs. Pipchin shortly, "'and there's nobody like me, I suppose.' "'Ain't there really, though?' asked Paul, "'leaning forward in his chair and looking at her very hard. "'No.' said the old lady. "'I'm glad of that,' observed Paul, rubbing his hands thoughtfully. "'That's a very good thing.' Mrs. Pipchin didn't dare to ask him why, lest she should receive some perfectly annihilating answer. But as a compensation to her wounded feelings, she harassed Master Bitherstone to that extent, until bedtime, that it began that very night to make arrangements for an overland return to India, by secreting from his supper a quarter of a round of bread and a fragment of moist Dutch cheese 
as the beginning of a stock of provision to support him on the voyage. Mrs. Pipchin had kept watch and ward over little Paul and his sister for nearly twelve months. They had been home twice, but only for a few days, and had been constant in their weekly visits to Mr. Dombey at the hotel. By little and little Paul had grown stronger, and had become able to dispense with his carriage, though he still looked thin and delicate, and still remained the same old, quiet, dreamy child that he had been when first consigned to Mrs. Pipchin's care. One Saturday afternoon, at dusk, great consternation was occasioned in the castle by the unlooked-for announcement of Mr. Dombey as a visitor to Mrs. Pipchin. The population of the parlour was immediately swept upstairs, as on the wings of a whirlwind, and after much slamming of bedroom doors and trampling overhead, and some knocking about of Master Bitherstone by Mrs. Pipchin, as a relief to the perturbation of her spirits, the black bombazine garments of the worthy old lady darkened the audience chamber where Mr. Dombey was contemplating the vacant armchair of his son and heir. "'Mrs. Pipchin,' said Mr. Dombey, "'how do you do?' "'Thank you, sir,' said Mrs. Pipchin. "'I'm pretty well, considering.' Mrs. Pipchin always used that form of words. It meant considering her virtues, sacrifices, and so forth. "'I can't expect, sir, to be very well,' said Mrs. Pipchin, taking a chair and fetching her breath. "'But such health as I have, I am grateful for.' Mr. Dombey inclined his head with the satisfied air of a patron, who felt that this was the sort of thing for which he paid so much a quarter. After a moment's silence he went on to say, "'Mrs. Pipchin,' "'I have taken the liberty of calling to consult you in reference to my son. "'I have had it in my mind to do so for some time past, "'but have deferred it from time to time, "'in order that his health might be thoroughly re-established. "'You have no misgivings on that subject, Mrs. Pipchin?' "'Brighton has proved very beneficial, sir,' returned Mrs. Pipchin. "'Very beneficial indeed.' "'I propose,' said Mr. Dombey, his remaining at Brighton. Mrs. Pipchin rubbed her hands and bent her grey eyes on the fire. But, pursued Mr. Dombey, stretching out his forefinger, but possibly that he should now make a change and lead a different kind of life here. In short, Mrs. Pipchin, that is the object of my visit. My son is getting on, Mrs. Pipchin. Really, he is getting on. There was something melancholy in the triumphant air with which Mr. Dombey said this. It showed how long Paul's childish life had been to him, and how his hopes were set upon a later stage of his existence. Pity may appear a strange word to connect with any one so haughty and so cold, and yet he seemed a worthy subject for it at that moment. Six years old,' said Mr. Dombey, settling his neckcloth perhaps to hide an irrepressible smile that rather seemed to strike upon the surface of his face and glance away, as finding no resting-place than to play there for an instant. "'Dear me, six will be changed to sixteen, before we have time to look about us.' Ten years,' croaked the unsympathetic Pipchin, with a frosty glistening of her hard grey eye, and a dreary shaking of her bent head, "'is a long time.' "'It depends on circumstances,' returned Mr. Dombey. "'At all events, Mrs. Pipchin, my son is six years old, and there is no doubt, I fear, that in his studies he is behind many children of his age or his youth,' said Mr. Dombey, quickly answering what he mistrusted was a shrewd twinkle of the frosty eye. "'His youth is a more appropriate expression. Now, Mrs. Pipchin, Instead of being behind his peers, my son ought to be before them, far before them. There is an eminence ready for him to mount upon. There is nothing of chance or doubt in the course before my son. His way in life was clear and prepared and marked out before he existed. The education of such a young gentleman must not be delayed. It must not be left imperfect. It must be very steadily and seriously undertaken, Mrs. Pipchin. "'Well, sir,' said Mrs. Pipchin, "'I can say nothing to the contrary.' 
"'I was quite sure, Mrs. Pipchin,' returned Mr. Dombey approvingly, "'that a person of your good sense could not and would not.' "'There is a great deal of nonsense, and worse, talked about young people not being pressed too hard at first, and being tempted on, and all the rest of it, sir,' said Mrs. Pipchin, impatiently rubbing her hooked nose. "'It never was thought of in my time, and it has no business to be thought of now. My opinion is, keep em at it.' "'My good madam,' returned Mr. Dombey, you have not acquired your reputation undeservedly. And I beg you to believe, Mrs. Pipchin, that I am more than satisfied with your excellent system of management, and shall have the greatest pleasure in commending it whenever my poor commendation. Mr. Dombey's loftiness, when he affected to disparage his own importance, passed all bounds. Can be of any service. I have been thinking of Dr. Blimber's, Mrs. Pipchin. My neighbour, sir? said Mrs. Pipchin. "'I believe the doctor's is an excellent establishment. I've heard that it's very strictly conducted, and there is nothing but learning going on from morning to night.' "'And it's very expensive,' added Mr. Dombey. "'And it's very expensive, sir,' returned Mrs. Pipchin, catching at the fact, as if in omitting that, she had omitted one of its leading merits. "'I have had some communication with the doctor, Mrs. Pipchin,' said Mr. Dombey, hitching his chair anxiously a little nearer to the fire. "'And he does not consider Paul at all too young for his purpose. He mentioned several instances of boys in Greek at about the same age. "'If I have any little uneasiness in my own mind, Mrs. Pipchin, on the subject of this change, it is not on that head.' My son, not having known a mother, has gradually concentrated much, too much, of his childish affection on his sister. Whether their separation— Mr. Dombey said no more, but sat silent. Heighty tighty exclaimed Mrs. Pipchin, shaking out her black bombazine skirts and plucking up all the ogress within her. If she don't like it, Mr. Dombey, she must be taught to lump it. The good lady apologised immediately afterwards for using so common a figure of speech, but said, and truly, that that was the way she reasoned with them. Mr. Dombey waited until Mrs. Pipchin had done bridling and shaking her head, and frowning down a legion of bitherstones and pankies, and then said quietly, but correctively, "'He, my good madam, he.' Mrs. Pipchin's system— would have applied very much the same mode of cure to any uneasiness on the part of Paul, too. But as the hard grey eye was sharp enough to see that the recipe, however Mr. Dombey might admit its efficacy in the case of the daughter, was not a sovereign remedy for the son, she argued the point, and contended that change, and new society, and the different form of life he would lead at Dr. Blimber's, and the studies he would have to master, would very soon prove sufficient alienations. As this chimed in with Mr. Dombey's own hope and belief, it gave that gentleman a still higher opinion of Mrs. Pipchin's understanding. And as Mrs. Pipchin, at the same time, bewailed the loss of her dear little friend, which was not an overwhelming shock to her, as she had long expected it, and had not looked in the beginning for his remaining with her longer than three months, he formed an equally good opinion of Mrs. Pipchin's disinterestedness. It was plain that he had given the subject anxious consideration— for he had formed a plan, which he announced to the ogress, of sending Paul to the doctors as a weekly boarder for the first half-year, during which time Florence would remain at the castle, that she might receive her brother there on Saturdays. This would wean him by degrees, Mr. Dombey said, possibly with a recollection of his not having been weaned by degrees on a former occasion. Mr. Dombey finished the interview by expressing his hope that Mrs. Pipchin would still remain in office as general superintendent and overseer of his son, pending his studies at Brighton, and having kissed Paul, and shaken hands with Florence, and beheld Master Bitherstone in his collar of state, and made Miss Pankey cry by patting her on the head, in which region she was uncommonly tender, on account of a habit Mrs. Pipchin had of sounding it with her knuckles like a cask, he withdrew to his hotel and dinner resolved that Paul, now that he was getting so old and well, should begin a vigorous course of education forthwith, 
to qualify him for the position in which he was to shine, and that Dr. Blimber should take him in hand immediately. Whenever a young gentleman was taken in hand by Dr. Blimber, he might consider himself sure of a pretty tight squeeze. The doctor only undertook the charge of ten young gentlemen, but he had, always ready, a supply of learning for a hundred, on the lowest estimate, and it was at once the business and delight of his life to gorge the unhappy ten with it. In fact, Dr. Blimber's establishment was a great hothouse, in which there was a forcing apparatus incessantly at work. All the boys blew before their time. Mental green peas were produced at Christmas, and intellectual asparagus all the year round. Mathematical gooseberries, very sour ones too, were common at untimely seasons, and from mere sprouts of bushes, under Dr. Blimber's cultivation. Every description of Greek and Latin vegetable was got off the driest twigs of boys, under the frostiest circumstances. Nature was of no consequence at all. No matter what a young gentleman was intended to bear, Dr. Blimber made him bear to pattern, somehow or other. This was all very pleasant and ingenious, but the system of forcing was attended with its usual disadvantages. There was not the right taste about the premature productions, and they didn't keep well. Moreover, one young gentleman, with a swollen nose and an excessively large head, the oldest of the ten who had gone through everything, suddenly left off blowing one day, and remained in the establishment a mere stork. And people did say that the doctor had rather overdone it with young toots, and that when he began to have whiskers, he left off having brains. There young toots was, at any rate, possessed of the gruffest of voices and the shrillest of minds, sticking ornamental pins into his shirt, and keeping a ring in his waistcoat pocket to put on his little finger by stealth when the pupils went out walking, constantly falling in love by sight with nursery-maids, who had no idea of his existence, and looking at the gas-lighted world over the little iron bars in the left-hand corner window of the front three pairs of stairs after bedtime, like a greatly overgrown cherub who had sat up aloft much too long. The doctor was a portly gentleman, in a suit of black, with strings at his knees and stockings below them. He had a bald head, highly polished, a deep voice, and a chin so very double that it was a wonder how he ever managed to shave into the creases. He had likewise a pair of little eyes that were always half shut up, and a mouth that was always half expanded into a grin, as if he had, that moment, posed a boy and were waiting to convict him from his own lips insomuch that when the doctor put his right hand into the breast of his coat, and with his other hand behind him, and a scarcely perceptible wag of his head, made the commonest observation to a nervous stranger, it was like a sentiment from the Sphinx, and settled his business. The doctor's was a mighty fine house, fronting the sea. Not a joyful style of house within, but quite the contrary. Sad coloured curtains, whose proportions were spare and lean, hid themselves despondently behind the windows. The tables and chairs were put away in rows, like figures in a sum. Fires were so rarely lighted in the rooms of ceremony, that they felt like wells, and a visitor represented the bucket. The dining-room seemed the last place in the world where any eating or drinking was likely to occur. There was no sound through all the house but the ticking of a great clock in the hall, which made itself audible in the very garrets and sometimes a dull cooing of young gentlemen at their lessons, like the murmurings of an assemblage of melancholy pigeons. Miss Blimber, too, although a slim and graceful maid, did no soft violence to the gravity of the house. There was no light nonsense about Miss Blimber. She kept her hair short and crisp, and wore spectacles. She was dry and sandy with working in the graves of deceased languages. None of your live languages for Miss Blimber, they must be dead, stone dead, and then Miss Blimber dug them up like a ghoul. Mrs. Blimber, her mamma, was not learned herself, but she pretended to be, and that did quite as well. She said at evening parties that if she could have known Cicero, she thought she could have died contented. It was the steady joy of her life to see the doctor's young gentleman go out walking, unlike all other young gentlemen, in the largest possible shirt-collars, and the stiffest possible cravats. It was so classical, she said. 
As to Mr. Feeder, B.A., Dr. Blimber's assistant, he was a kind of human barrel-organ, with a little list of tunes at which he was continually working, over and over again, without any variation. He might have been fitted up with a change of barrels, perhaps in early life, if his destiny had been favourable, but it had not been, and he had only one with which, in a monotonous round, it was his occupation to bewilder the young ideas of Dr. Blimber's young gentleman. The young gentlemen were prematurely full of carking anxieties. They knew no rest from the pursuit of stony-hearted verbs, savage noun substantives, inflexible syntactic passages, and ghosts of exercises that appeared to them in their dreams. Under the forcing system, a young gentleman usually took leave of his spirits in three weeks. He had all the cares of the world on his head in three months. He conceived bitter sentiments against his parents or guardians in four, he was an old misanthrope in five, envied Curtius that blessed refuge in the earth in six, and the end of the first twelve month had arrived at the conclusion from which he never afterwards departed, that all the fancies of the poets and lessons of the sages were a mere collection of words and grammar, and had no other meaning in the world. But he went on blow, blow, blowing in the doctor's hothouse all the time and the doctor's glory and reputation were great when he took his wintry growth home to his relations and friends. Upon the doctor's doorsteps one day, Paul stood with a fluttering heart, and with his small right hand in his father's. His other hand was locked in that of Florence. How tight the tiny pressure of that one, and how loose and cold the other. Mrs. Pipchin hovered behind the victim, with her sable plumage and her hooked beak like a bird of ill omen, she was out of breath, for Mr. Dombey, full of great thoughts, had walked fast, and she croaked hoarsely as she waited for the opening of the door. "'Now, Paul,' said Mr. Dombey exultingly, "'this is the way, indeed, to be Dombey and son, and have money. You are almost a man already.' "'Almost,' returned the child. Even his childish agitation could not master the sly and quaint, yet touching look with which he accompanied the reply. It brought a vague expression of dissatisfaction into Mr. Dombey's face, but the door being opened, it was quickly gone. "'Dr. Blimber is at home, I believe,' said Mr. Dombey. The man said yes, and as they passed in, looked at Paul as if he were a little mouse, and the house were a trap. He was a weak-eyed young man, with the first faint streaks or early dawn of a grin on his countenance. It was mere imbecility but Mrs. Pipchin took it into her head there was impudence, and made a snap at him directly. "'How dare you laugh behind the gentleman's back?' said Mrs. Pipchin. "'And what do you take me for?' "'I ain't a-laughing at nobody, and I'm sure I don't take you for nothing, ma'am,' returned the young man in consternation. "'A pack of idle dogs,' said Mrs. Pipchin. "'Only fit to be turnspits.' "'Go and tell your master that Mr. Dombey's here, or it'll be the worse for you.' The weak-eyed young man went, very meekly, to discharge himself of this commission, and soon came back to invite them to the doctor's study. "'You're laughing again, sir,' said Mrs. Pipchin, when it came to her turn, bringing up the rear to pass him in the hall. "'I ain't,' returned the young man, grievously oppressed. "'I never see such a thing as this.' "'What is the matter, Mrs. Pipchin?' said Mr. Dombey, looking round. Softly, pray. Mrs. Pipchin, in her deference, merely muttered at the young man as she passed on, and said, Oh, he was a precious fellow, leaving the young man, who was all meekness and incapacity, affected even to tears by the incident. But Mrs. Pipchin had a way of falling foul of all meek people, and her friends said, who could wonder at it, after the Peruvian mines. The doctor was sitting in his portentous study, with a globe at each knee, books all round him, Homer over the door, and Minerva on the mantel-shelf. "'And how do you do, sir?' he said to Mr. Dombey. "'And how is my little friend?' Grave as an organ was the doctor's speech, and when he ceased, the great clock in the hall seemed, to Paul at least, to take him up, and to go on saying— how is my little friend? 
how is my little friend? Over and over and over again. The little friend, being something too small to be seen at all from where the doctor sat, over the books on his table, the doctor made several futile attempts to get a view of him round the legs, which Mr. Dombey, perceiving, relieved the doctor from his embarrassment by taking Paul up in his arms and sitting him on another little table over against the doctor in the middle of the room. Ha! said the doctor, leaning back in his chair with his hand in his breast. Now I see, my little friend. How do you do, my little friend? The clock in the hall wouldn't subscribe to this alteration in the form of words, but continued to repeat, How is my little friend? How is my little friend? Very well, I thank you, sir, returned Paul, answering the clock quite as much as the doctor. Ha! said Dr. Blimber. Shall we make a man of him? Do you hear, Paul? added Mr. Dombey, Paul being silent. Shall we make a man of him? repeated the doctor. I had rather be a child, replied Paul. Indeed, said the doctor. Why? The child sat on the table looking at him, with a curious expression of suppressed emotion in his face, and beating one hand proudly on his knee, as if he had the rising tears beneath it, and crushed them. But his other hand strayed a little way the while, a little farther, farther from him yet, until it lighted on the neck of Florence. This is why, it seemed to say, and then the steady look was broken up and gone, the working lip was loosened, and the tears came streaming forth. "'Mrs. Pipchin,' said his father, in a querulous manner, "'I am really very sorry to see this.' "'Come away from him, do, Miss Dombey,' quoth the matron. "'Never mind,' said the doctor, blandly nodding his head, to keep Mrs. Pipchin back. "'Never mind. We shall substitute new cares and new impressions, Mr. Dombey, very shortly. You would still wish my little friend to acquire—' "'Everything, if you please, doctor,' returned Mr. Dombey firmly. "'Yes,' said the doctor, who, with his half-shut eyes and his usual smile, seemed to survey Paul with the sort of interest that might attach to some choice little animal he was going to stuff. "'Yes, exactly. Ha! We shall impart a great variety of information to our little friend, and bring him quickly forward, I dare say.' "'I dare say. Quite a virgin soil, I believe you said, Mr. Dombey?' "'Except some ordinary preparation at home, and from this lady,' replied Mr. Dombey, introducing Mrs. Pipchin, who instantly communicated a rigidity to her whole muscular system, and snorted defiance beforehand, in case the doctor should disparage her. "'Except so far, Paul has, as yet, applied himself to no studies at all.' Dr. Blimber inclined his head, in gentle tolerance of such insignificant poaching as Mrs. Pipchin's, and said he was glad to hear it. It was much more satisfactory, he observed, rubbing his hands to begin at the foundation. And again he leered at Paul, as if he would have liked to tackle him with the Greek alphabet on the spot. "'That circumstance, indeed, Dr. Blimber,' pursued Mr. Dombey, glancing at his little son, and the interview I have already had the pleasure of holding with you, renders any further explanation, and consequently any further intrusion, on your valuable time, so unnecessary that— Now, Miss Dombey, said the acid Pipchin. Permit me, said the doctor, one moment. Allow me to present Mrs. Blimber and my daughter, who will be associated with the domestic life of our young pilgrim to Parnassus, Mrs. Blimber. For the lady, who had perhaps been in waiting, opportunely entered, followed by her daughter, that fair sexton in spectacles. Mr. Dombey, my daughter Cornelia, Mr. Dombey. Mr. Dombey, my love, pursued the doctor, turning to his wife, is so confiding as to— Do you see your little friend?
Mrs. Blimber, in an excess of politeness of which Mr. Dombey was the object, apparently did not, for she was backing against the little friend, and very much endangering his position on the table. But, on this hint, she turned to admire his classical and intellectual lineaments, and turning again to Mr. Dombey said, with a sigh, that she envied his dear son. "'Like a bee, sir,' said Mrs. Blimber, with uplifted eyes, "'about to plunge into a garden of the choicest flowers, "'and sip the sweets for the first time, "'Virgil, Horace, Ovid, Terence, Plautus, Cicero. "'What a world of honey have we here! "'It may appear remarkable, Mr. Dombey, "'in one who is a wife, the wife of such a husband.' "'Hush, hush!' said Dr. Blimber. Fie for shame. Mr. Dombey will forgive the partiality of a wife, said Mrs. Blimber, with an engaging smile. Mr. Dombey answered, Not at all, applying those words, it is to be presumed, to the partiality, and not to the forgiveness. And it may seem remarkable in one who is a mother also, resumed Mrs. Blimber, "'And such a mother,' observed Mr. Dombey, bowing with some confused idea of being complimentary to Cornelia. "'But really,' pursued Mrs. Blimber, "'I think if I could have known Cicero, and been his friend, and talked with him in his retirement at Tusculum, beautiful Tusculum, I could have died contented.' A learned enthusiasm is so very contagious that Mr. Dombey half believed this was exactly his case, and even Mrs. Pipchin, who was not, as we have seen, of an accommodating disposition, generally gave utterance to a little sound between a groan and a sigh, as if she would have said that nobody but Cicero could have proved a lasting consolation under that failure of the Peruvian mines, but that he indeed would have been a very Davy lamp of refuge. Cornelia looked at Mr. Dombey through her spectacles, as if she would have liked to crack a few quotations with him from the authority in question. But this design, if she entertained it, was frustrated by a knock at the room door. "'Who is that?' said the doctor. "'Oh, come in, Toots, come in. Mr. Dombey, sir.' Toots bowed. "'Quite a coincidence,' said Dr. Blimber. Here we have the beginning and the end, Alpha and Omega, our head boy, Mr. Dombey. The doctor might have called him their head and shoulders boy, for he was at least that much taller than any of the rest. He blushed very much at finding himself among strangers, and chuckled aloud. An addition to our little portico, Toots, said the doctor. Mr. Dombey's son. Young Toots blushed again and finding from a solemn silence which prevailed that he was expected to say something, said to Paul, "'How are you?' in a voice so deep, and a manner so sheepish, that if a lamb had roared, it couldn't have been more surprising. "'Ask Mr. Feeder, if you please, Toots,' said the doctor, "'to prepare a few introductory volumes for Mr. Dombey's son, and to allot him a convenient seat for study. My dear, I believe Mr. Dombey has not seen the dormitories. "'If Mr. Dombey will walk upstairs,' said Mrs. Blimber, "'I shall be more than proud to show him the dominions of the drowsy god.' With that, Mrs. Blimber, who was a lady of great suavity and a wiry figure, and who wore a cap composed of sky-blue materials, proceeded upstairs with Mr. Dombey and Cornelia, Mrs. Pipchin following, and looking out sharp for her enemy, the footman. While they were gone, Paul sat upon the table, holding Florence by the hand, and glancing timidly from the doctor round and round the room, while the doctor, leaning back in his chair, with his hand in his breast as usual, held a book from him at arm's length, and read. There was something very awful in this manner of reading. It was such a determined, unimpassioned, inflexible, cold-blooded way of going to work. It left the doctor's countenance exposed to view, and when the doctor smiled suspiciously at his author, or knit his brows, or shook his head and made wry faces at him as much as to say, "'Don't tell me, sir, I know better,' 
it was terrific. Toots, too, had no business to be outside the door, ostentatiously examining the wheels in his watch and counting his half-crowns. But that didn't last long, for Dr. Blimber, happening to change the position of his tight, plump legs, as if he were going to get up, Toots swiftly vanished and appeared no more. Mr. Dombey and his conductress were soon heard coming downstairs again, talking all the way, and presently they re-entered the doctor's study. "'I hope, Mr. Dombey,' said the doctor, laying down his book, "'that the arrangements meet your approval.' "'They are excellent, sir,' said Mr. Dombey. "'Very fair indeed,' said Mrs. Pipchin, in a low voice, never disposed to give too much encouragement. "'Mrs. Pipchin,' said Mr. Dombey, wheeling round, "'will, with your permission, doctor and Mrs. Blimber, visit Paul now and then?' "'Whenever Mrs. Pipchin pleases,' observed the doctor. "'Always happy to see her,' said Mrs. Blimber. "'I think,' said Mr. Dombey, "'I have given all the trouble I need, and may take my leave. "'Paul, my child,' he went close to him as he sat upon the table. "'Good-bye.' "'Good-bye, Papa.' The limp and careless little hand that Mr. Dombey took in his— was singularly out of keeping with the wistful face. But he had no part in its sorrowful expression. It was not addressed to him. No, no. To Florence. All to Florence. If Mr. Dombey, in his insolence of wealth, had ever made an enemy, hard to appease and cruelly vindictive in his hate, even such an enemy might have received the pang that wrung his proud heart then, as compensation for his injury. He bent down over his boy and kissed him. If his sight were dimmed as he did so by something that for a moment blurred the little face and made it indistinct to him, his mental vision may have been for that short time the clearer, perhaps. "'I shall see you soon, Paul. You are free on Saturdays and Sundays, you know.' "'Yes, Papa,' returned Paul, looking at his sister. "'On Saturdays and Sundays.' "'And you'll try and learn a great deal here, and be a clever man,' said Mr. Dombey. "'Won't you?' "'I'll try,' returned the child wearily. "'And you'll soon be grown up now,' said Mr. Dombey. "'Oh, very soon,' replied the child. Once more the old, old look passed rapidly across his features like a strange light. It fell on Mrs. Pipchin, and extinguished itself in her black dress. That excellent ogress stepped forward to take leave, and to bear off Florence, which she had long been thirsting to do. The move on her part roused Mr. Dombey, whose eyes were fixed on Paul. After patting him on the head, and pressing his small hand again, he took leave of Dr. Blimber, Mrs. Blimber, and Miss Blimber, with his usual polite frigidity, and walked out of the study. Despite his entreaty that they would not think of stirring, Dr. Blimber, Mrs. Blimber, and Miss Blimber all pressed forward to attend him to the hall, and thus Mrs. Pipchin got into a state of entanglement with Miss Blimber and the doctor, and was crowded out of the study before she could clutch Florence, to which happy accident Paul stood afterwards indebted for the dear remembrance that Florence ran back to throw her arms round his neck, and that hers was the last face in the doorway, turned towards him with a smile of encouragement the brighter for the tears through which it beamed. It made his childish bosom heave and swell when it was gone, and sent the globes, the books, blind Homer and Minerva, swimming round the room. But they stopped, all of a sudden, and then he heard the loud clock in the hall, still gravely inquiring, "'How is my little friend? How is my little friend?' as it had done before. He sat with folded hands upon his pedestal, silently listening. But he might have answered, Weary, weary, very lonely, very sad. And there, with an aching void in his young heart, and all outside so cold and bare and strange, Paul sat as if he had taken life unfurnished, and the upholsterer were never coming. End of chapter 11